Welcome to Knights of the Braille. Knights of the Braille are groups of blind and visually impaired Dungeons and Dragons players. If you would like to get more information, please visit knightsofthebraille.com. Hello and welcome to a beginner's guide to creating a Dungeons and Dragons character. I'm Jim from Knights of the Braille. I'm going to talk you through how you make a character as best I can. I'm going to speak to complete beginners. So this is under the assumption that you've never played the game before. You don't know how any of it works. The idea behind this is that a lot of people seem to say, you know, I really want to play the game. I understand how the game works, but I have no idea where to begin creating a character. It seems overwhelming and intimidating. And I agree. I think character creation is the worst introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. I think playing the game is the best way to learn the mechanics and learn how a character works. The first time you create a character, it might not be optimal, but it can be fun. And that's what we're going to try to do today. Uh, if you get the opportunity, I'd suggest running in a one-shot where you just do a quick character creation when you get there. You just pick an ability you're good with, a skill you're good with, and a weapon, and you get a basic armor class. I've run one-shots like that before for brand new people who've never played that want to try it out and don't want to create a character. It's a lot of fun. But there aren't many games like that. Most require you to make a full character, and that's what we're going to do right now. So before we begin, I'm going to make the assumption that the person listening to this has never ever played before and so I'm going to explain the first question you may have which is how the hell do we play the game it's pretty simple you have your character so that could be let's say an elven ranger which is usually a pretty cliche but pretty popular character to play and this elven ranger you engage with the Dungeons and Dragons world in two main ways. The first is role play, so that's who you are. You are an Elven Ranger. Maybe you're a bit of an edge lord and no one understands you and can get along with you and you do things your own way. Or maybe you want to do the best you can for the world and get along with everyone. And that part's pretty straightforward. It's who you want to be. The second part is the game mechanics. That is boiled down to rolling a 20 sided dice so your elven ranger comes into a situation and they want to do something they want to steal some money out of an orc's pocket so what happens you say to the dungeon master i want to steal gold from this orc they'll get you to roll a 20 sided dice and that's how we do everything if you want to do something in a game attack steal sneak hide persuade you roll a 20 sided dice and the dungeon master decides if that number is high enough for your character to succeed. So when you're creating a character, you're not just creating who you are for the role playing part, but your character determines the 20 sided dice result as it influences it, which we'll go into later. But to begin, first two main mechanics, role playing and dice rolling. And it comes down to mostly that. That's what you'll be doing for 90% of the time you're playing this game. So, what makes up a Dungeons & Dragons character? Uh, I'd say the three most important parts are your race, your class, and your background. So, the races are typical fantasy archetypes, you know, elves, dwarves, humans. There's other ones in there as well, like specific to Dungeons & Dragons, like Tiefling. If you're not sure who you want to play as, what race, I'd recommend a human because humans are very adaptable. They cover all your bases. If you want to play as any class, a human's usually pretty good for doing that. Although your race doesn't really determine your what class you're going to play, you, you can pretty much go with any character in class. So what is the class? The class is your job. So I'm not talking about washing dishes or, you know, doing the cash register at the local grocery store. Your class is your job within the group. 
Are you a fighter? Are you a paladin? Are you a wizard? Your class defines how you approach combat, what skills you have, everything like that. It's a pretty major part. To begin with, I would not recommend going with a wizard. A lot of people want to be a wizard or a thief is usually the one of those two is what they want to go with. I would strongly recommend if this is your first ever character, go with a fighter. So if you've never played before, a human fighter is a pretty typical one. It may seem boring, but it's very basic. You get into wizards, you get into spell casting. We're not going to cover spell casting in this. We're just going to get you a basic character going. If you want to be a human fighter, that's what I'd recommend. Although you can pick another race if you want to be an elf or a dwarf. But a fighter is your class. Highly recommended. Your background. So you've got your race, which is, you know, the fantasy archetype that you are. The, the human, the elf, the dwarf. You've got your class, your fighter, your ranger, your paladin, your rogue, your wizard. The background. The background is kind of flavour. So... Up until this point, your character has lived a life. They've done stuff. They've been out and about. And they picked up skills along the way. So this comes down to the background of your character. Are you a criminal? Were you a hermit? Were you a religious acolyte? A criminal is a usual uh, popular background because it gives you a bit of you know, uncertainty to who you are. It's very exciting. Uh, a criminal's great. I'd, I'd recommend that as a good background. If there's any background there you enjoy, then you can go for that. It doesn't have too much of an impact. It just gives you a few extra skills. But it also gives you features that are sort of flavour for role-playing your character. It gives you a bit more depth to your story. As you go on in Dungeons & Dragons, you can create your own background with the help of your game master. For now, just pick one of the base backgrounds there it doesn't matter too much which one you pick but um, it influences your who your character is quite a bit so that's your race so if you're not sure which race i recommend human your class if you're not sure on your class i recommend a fighter and your background if you're not sure just pick whichever one sounds cool which brings us on to the most important part before we get started on this step-by-step -step guide the most important part is the rule of cool. If something sounds cool, pick that. To be honest, in your first playthrough, just pick whatever sounds cool to you and do that. And you probably have a great time and you won't have to worry too much about backtracking or worrying about not having an optimal character. Just have a good time. That's why you're there. You'll learn for next time what type of character you want to be. Every time we play Dungeons and Dragons, we learn what we should have done better for next time and that's going to be an ongoing thing for years and years and years so let's get started so how do you create a character before step one i'd recommend reading the player's handbook the dungeons and dragons player's handbook it gives a lot of good information it has all the races all the classes all the backgrounds and this is stuff that you're gonna need so when you come into your character creation, make sure you have a way to take notes or write down which race, class, background you want. And then we'll move forward from there. As we go through the steps, I'll tell you what to keep track of, what to write down, and then how we're going to use that information later on. So we're going to start basic and then we're going to get deeper into it as we go through. I'll miss out a couple of bits here, a couple of bits that maybe a bit more in depth for later that you can go with your game master but this will get you started and after you started please do ask your game master if you're not sure on something ask them they want you to be prepared they want you to have the knowledge to play the game they want you involved do not be afraid to ask questions people in the hobby love new people love answering questions and the more you know the better the game will be so step one and creating a character pick a name it might not see that seem that important but the name is going to stick with you for a while people are going to keep calling you that in the game as they refer to you you know you can pick a fun name like crap bag if that's what you want your name to be but you're going to get called you know crap or mr bag or crappity bag for months if not years so probably should pick a good name before going forward 
Next, you're going to pick your race. So write down your race, which one you want to play as. As I said, Hume is a pretty good bet, but mechanically, your race gives you ability score increases that are race specific. So um, these race specific ability scores uh, are usually one or two point increase. So I've already thrown a term out there that might confuse you, ability score. What the heck is an ability score? An ability score is what makes up your character. So there are six ability scores, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. These all contribute to determining who your character is in terms of their abilities. So obviously your your strength is your athleticism, your dexterity is how quick you are, constitution is how tough you are, intelligence is your knowledge, wisdom is your sort of background knowledge out in the world. Just think of intelligence as inside your head and wisdom is outside of your head, the knowledge of those two things. Charisma is obviously your ability to talk and persuade others. We'll come back to those skill, oh, sorry, abilities later as we go through it. But those are the six abilities to think about for now when you're picking your race because that's what it influences. So humans get a plus one to all their abilities. You know, dwarves get a big boost to constitution because they're tough. And elves get a bonus to dexterity as they're very quick. These are all things to consider. Do you want your character to be quick, tough, or an all-around good at everything as you move forward? But yeah, I'd say pick the race that sounds cool. If you want to be a dwarf, pick a dwarf. Uh, if you're not sure, pick a human. Step three, pick a class. As I said before, I would highly recommend, if this is your first time playing, you pick a fighter. You could pick a rogue. There's a few more mechanics at play there. But going with a fighter, you can't really go wrong. You bash stuff over the head, you get bashed over the head. You go back and forth. If this is your very first time playing, unless you're much smarter than me, which you probably are, you should pick a wizard. Or not pick a wizard. <laughs> um, yeah, don't pick a wizard. Pick a fighter, a rogue, maybe a paladin. If you want a bit of magic, pick a paladin. But don't go full wizard, sorcerer. Nothing like that. I highly recommend you not. But, again, if it sounds cool, if you want to do it, pick it. But just be prepared to put a bit more work in on your first playthrough. But I imagine most people don't want more on their plates. Step four. Pick a background. So, as I said before, background gives you a few little bonus things. A few little extra tricks up your sleeve, which we'll come back to later. But... Pick the coolest background there, write it down, and we'll come back to that later. So, step five. You're going to generate your ability scores. So as I said before, you have six abilities, core abilities. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. All six of these abilities are represented by a numerical value. So this numerical value typically goes anywhere from 1 to 20. 10 is the average. So you're, if you're averagely strong, if you're averagely fast, you're at a 10. Anything above that, good. Anything below that, not so good. How do these numbers affect your character? Well, obviously, if you have a higher number, you're better at that ability. Typically, we'd say that most adventurers would be around a 10 or higher. Having less than a 10 is quite common. A lot of people actually enjoy that. They like to have a bit of a disadvantage at one thing to force them to be better at the other things and accommodate for that. But to get these six numbers for your abilities, you have to roll for them. That's the most traditional way in which people generate these ability scores is they'll roll dice to determine what they are. There is a point by system, and to use the point by system is a little more advanced. There are calculators online. I would recommend not doing that on your first playthrough unless your game master specifically requests that you do. 
the rolling dice is by far the easiest one. Typically we say roll seven 20 sided dice. If the result is lower than eight, re-roll them. Then once you have seven numbers above eight, get rid of the lowest one. Use the six for your abilities. So how do you decide which number to put in which ability? Well, in order to decide that, you need to know what the abilities do. So I'm going to quickly go through exactly what the abilities do. Um, we'll start off with strength. Strength directly affects how accurate and deadly you are with physical weapons, so you know things like swords. It determines how good you are at hitting someone and damaging them with that sword also affects how athletic you are so if you want someone who's good with swords and athleticism so like barbarians fighters paladins any of those characters you want strength so if you're making a fighter for your first character you want to have some strength next up is your dexterity so your dexterity affects how accurate and damaging you are with your ranged weapons so obviously something like a bow you know, if you're using a, a longbow in combat, you want to be ranged, you want dexterity. It also affects your agility and reflexes. It's pretty important for characters like rangers, would be the most common one, rogues. And also monks. Um, probably not going to delve into them on your first playthrough, but a ranger or a rogue, you definitely want good dexterity. Constitution is the next ability score. This one's pretty basic, it doesn't affect any skills really with your character, all constitution affects is your health points. So when you make your character, your constitution will directly affect how many hit points you have, which we'll come to later. But yeah, constitution is one of those things where if you think you're going to get hit a lot in combat, put some points into your constitution. So if you're making a fighter for example, you want to have the highest dice roll out of your six put into the strength so let's say the highest dice roll you had was a 16 you assign that to your strength you've got 16 strength your next highest roll is a 14 i'd say put that in your constitution give you a pretty good bonus as we move down the list come to intelligence so your intelligence ability uh, it's good for wizards so if this is your first playthrough and you're not playing as a wizard intelligence is what we would call a dump stat so a dump stat is what you put your lowest number in because it's not that important to you now intelligence does affect your ability to retain information so it helps directly with knowing history or any knowledge related to that but if you're a fighter and you want to be tough uh, intelligence would be your dump stat, so the least important to you. The next ability, Wisdom, is pretty good. It's used for um, spell casting for druids and clerics, but also used for awareness. So you're outside of your own mind, your intelligence around you, um, spotting things, noticing things. Your wisdom is pretty important. I'd say it's a toss up between wisdom and your next ability, charisma. Charisma, obviously, fantastic for persuading, intimidating, deceiving people. Also used for bards, warlocks, sorcerers for their magic. Um, so I'd say a toss up between wisdom and charisma of whether you want to. Um, put points into those but yeah those are your six abilities and what they're used for so strength dexterity constitution intelligence wisdom charisma if you're creating a human fighter character i'd say in terms of importance it would go strength constitution um either charisma or wisdom dexterity intelligence your dexterity does affect other things but we won't go into that right now as you're just trying to get a character off the ground so before we go on to the next step let's quickly talk about 
Dungeons and Dragons dice slang. So, a common thing you'll hear is D20. So, people will be playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons and they'll say, roll a D20. What that means is, let's break it down pretty quick, D20. D means dice, 20 refers to the number of sides it has. So it's a 20 sided dice. If it's a D6, that's D for dice, and 6 for 6 sides, it's a 6 sided dice. It's as simple as that. If someone says roll a D20, you roll a 20 sided dice. You can get your, you know, Siri or Alexa or the G lady, which I have here, so I'm not going to say the name. You can get them to roll it for you. And commonly a 20 sided dice is what is used. Uh, any other dice are used for things like combat, stuff like that. You don't need to know about any of that. Just worry about a 20 sided dice. And once you've rolled your ability scores, so you've rolled 70, 20, discarded the lowest one, and then assigned the six other 20 sided dice results to your six abilities, um, we move on to the next step which is to calculate your ability scores so to calculate your ability scores is pretty simple there's a table for it the table is on our website knights of the braille.com go to game materials go to how to create a dungeons and dragons character i've put all of this into a document so you can reference it follow it step by step there's a list of tables at the end one of them is the ability score table. All this does is shows you what your ability score modifier is. So what is a modifier? A modifier is what you add to your dice result on behalf of your character. So that means if you're trying to do something in the game and you roll a 20 sided dice, you get to add your character's modifier for whatever that dice roll is. So let's say you have a fighter character who wants to perform something to do with their strength. So you're trying to push something. Your game master asks you to make a strength check. You roll a 20 sided dice. The result is a 10, but your strength modifier is two. So that means you get to add two to the result and make it a 12 because you're a stronger character. So therefore any result you have based on luck, you also get a bit of a boost, a boost of two based on it. So where does this modifier come from? It comes from your base ability scores. So let's say you rolled a 16 for your ability scores and you assign that to your strength so your strength is now 16 that's your base ability score your modifier for 16 would be 3 so how do I determine that well a 10 or an 11 is the baseline for any ability score that's a 0 that's a modifier of nothing 0 so after 10 and 11 it goes up so on even numbers, it bumps up one. So on a 12 or a 13, it goes up to one. On a 14 or a 15, it goes to two. 16, 17, it goes to three, and so on and so forth. This is in a table, which you can find on the internet. You can find on our website, nightsofthebraille.com. It's very simple to use. You just reference what your ability score is and determine the modifier. It will ask you for your modifier on the character sheet. Your modifier is also your saving throw for that ability so your abilities have their core value which is the number from 1 to 20 they have their modifier which is usually a number between 0 and 5 and it has the saving value which is usually between 0 and 5 so those are the basic parts you need you reference the ability score table or go up by even numbers so 10 or 11 to 0 12 13 1 and so on and each even number going up you can look at the table that's what i'd recommend to do easiest thing get your modifier value and your saving throw value fill those in pretty simple so the next step after your ability scores 
calculating your ability score modifier and calculating your ability score saving throw. Which brings us to the next logical step of character creation, which is adding proficiency. So what the hell is proficiency? Proficiency is how experienced your character is with something. So your experience with any given skill or tool is determined by a base number. At level 1, everyone's proficiency is 2. That means if you are skilled with something, experienced, if you are proficient with something, on top of the modifier, you get to add a proficiency bonus. So let's go back to that strength check you're trying to push something and you get to add two to the 20 sided dice result when you're pushing that object because you've got a high strength you have a strength modifier of two so you roll a 10 on the dice and you add your strength modifier of two but let's say for whatever reason the action you're doing you're experienced with it you get to add your proficiency bonus of 2 which would bring it from 12 to 14 so we started with a result of 10 on the dice we added 2 for your strength and then we added your proficiency of 2 giving a total of 14 to your result hopefully giving you a success on whatever you were doing so proficiency can be added onto things but you also have permanent proficiencies so your ability scores stay the same your ability score modifiers stay the same. However, your saving throws get proficiency. So when you pick a class, like the fighter, you get proficiency with certain saving throws. It will tell you right there under the fighter. You get proficiency with your strength saving throw and your constitution saving throw. So let's say your strength is 16 your strength modifier is uh, two, sorry, three. Um, your saving throw would also be three. So strength of 16, your strength modifier is three, your strength saving th throw is three. But you're a fighter, so you get a proficiency bonus with your saving throw, means you add another two. So that three for your saving throw becomes a permanent five, because you're proficient at it. This proficiency also works for weapons so if you're proficient with a weapon when you're going to hit someone with that weapon you get a bonus of plus two so you're rolling a 20 sided dice to see if you hit an enemy you roll a 10 that 10 becomes a 12 because you're proficient with that weapon it's pretty great your proficiency bonus increases as you level up it's clearly marked on the class list of bonuses you get as you look through the player's handbook it will tell you that your proficiency bonus goes up to three i think level five and it will continue to increase so as you become more skilled um your abilities and um your ability with weapons and skills will all increase thanks to your proficiency so now that we have your base ability score your ability modifier and your ability saving throw with your proficiency bonus added to the saving throw we now go to skills so your abilities are your core character abilities that affect how you perform as an individual with your smarts with your strength with your speed your toughness um, your skills are more specific variants of those so for example your charisma charisma is your ability to talk generally you could be good at talking so you could have a ability modifier of two for your charisma that would mean any skill related to charisma so things like deception intimidation performance persuasion all of those have a value of two because your charisma has a modifier 
of two. So that charisma modifier directly affects your skill modifiers. But those skills, because they're specific skills that you become talented at, some of them you get proficiency bonuses with. So that two becomes a four as you add your base proficiency bonus of two onto it. But those proficiencies with skills are based on your class. But before we go into the proficiency bonus, let's quickly go over the abilities and the skills because I know that could be a bit confusing. So let's strip it all back there, go back to your abilities where we were, ability base score, ability modifier, ability saving throw. We want your modifier. What are your ability modifiers and which skills do they affect? So let's start with the strength. Strength affects only one skill that you have, which is athletics. Uh, athletics is obviously your ability to run, swim, uh, do a number of things. Um, that's number one out of the 18 skills that every character has available to them. Next on the list is your dexterity ability modifier, which affects acrobatics, sleight of hand and stealth. So obviously acrobatics is your ability to jump and land and things like that. Sleight of hand to steal, pickpocket, stealth is to sneak. Uh, dexterity is pretty handy in terms of those skills. Your constitution ability modifier does not affect any skills. There are no skills that get a bonus from your constitution. Your intelligence affects arcana, history, investigation, nature and religion. Now I'm not going to explain all the skills are. You probably recognise some of them like, you know, history. Your ability to recall facts about history. Pretty straightforward. You'll learn most of these skills as you go. You're not required to remember any of them. But do remember the rule of cool. If it sounds good, you should pro probably pick that one. Um, next up, wisdom. Your wisdom affects your animal handling, insight, medicine, perception, and survival skills, which are all pretty handy. Uh, wisdom is a great ability modifier to have. Charisma. As I said before, it affects your deception, intimidation, performance, and persuasion. This is good for people that want to do a lot of talking and want to influence the people in their game. By people in the game I mean the non-player characters, so everyone else in the world except your party, although technically you can manipulate them if you choose to. So as I said, those ability scores all directly affect those skills, so your strength modifier of 2 means your athletics skill has a modifier of 2 as well. Charisma has a modifier of two your deception skill has a modifier of two it's pretty straightforward you just go through the list which ability affects which skill and what's the modifier let's just copy them over it's as simple as that then once you finish that part you just add your proficiency bonuses to some of the skills so depending on the class you pick you get proficiency with different skills so if you pick a fighter you get the option to choose athletics as a proficient skill. That would mean if you pick that on top of the, the base modifier for your athletic skill, you get to add another two. So that means that although your core abilities give you modifiers to take on tasks, your skills actually give you more specific modifiers to take on tasks, and that gives you a proficiency bonus. It's pretty handy. Um, so, as I said earlier, your proficiency bonus affects your weapons. So, if you're skilled with a sword, you get a plus two proficiency bonus when you roll into hit with your sword. But before we go into that, maybe I should talk a bit about how combat works. So, combat is the same as everything else where you decide you want to hit someone, so you roll a 20-sided dice or a d20. And that determines if you hit or not. As I said, you get bonuses to that. So a sword, you get a bonus from your strength, so you get to add your strength modifier. And you get a bonus if you're proficient, so you add your proficiency bonus too. If you roll a d20, 
the results of 10. Your strength modifier is 2. So because it's a sword, you add the 2 for a 12. Plus you're proficient with the sword, so you add another 2, you get a 14. So that's step 1 in combat. Step 2 is uh, rolling for damage. So under the weapon it will clearly mark what dice you roll to deal damage. Uh, let's say you're yeah, fine with a sword and it says 1d6. That means you roll one six-sided dice for damage. And if it's a sword, you get to add your strength modifier to that damage. So your strength modifier is two. You roll 1d6, a six-sided dice, you get a three. You get to add that strength modifier of two to make it a five and deal five damage to the enemy. But you do not get to add your proficiency bonus to the damage. So if you think of it this way, you get to add your proficiency to anything you're proficient with as long as you're rolling a d20, so a 20-sided dice. If you're rolling any other dice, usually you don't get to add your proficiency bonus unless the rules or your game master says so. So just remember, 20-sided dice, add your proficiency if you are proficient. If it's not a 20-sided dice, don't worry about it. So that's pretty much how combat works. You determine if you're in range to hit someone. Uh, close combat, you have to be within five feet. Uh, long range is usually, you know, anything above that. Once you've determined you're in, in range, you roll to hit, you make an attack roll. That's the 20-sided dice. You add your strength, you add your proficiency. If that number is equal to or higher than your enemy's armor class, you hit. Then after that, you roll for damage. So determine the range, roll to hit, and then roll for damage. And that's pretty much combat. I'll quickly go over the distances actually, now that I mention it, the five foot. So Dungeons and Dragons was traditionally played on a grid. That doesn't apply to us because we're using theater of the mind, but let's pretend we're on a grid where you move things one square at a time. Each of those squares is equal to five feet. So everything is measured in increments of five feet. That's why for a close combat weapon like a sword, you have to be within five feet. When we're playing a theater of the mind, I wouldn't worry so much about that. I just say to the game master, hey, uh, am I close enough to run up and hit this person? If they say, yeah, then you use your movement to run over and hit them. If you ask them, am I in range to hit this person? They say, no, you're not. You say, well, how do I make that happen? Theory of the mind is more about talking things through. I wouldn't worry too much about the measurements of feet and distance. I'd worry more about your ability as a character. So how do we determine which weapons you are proficient with? Well, it will tell you. It will tell you under your class information. So the class you picked, it will tell you whether you're proficient with simple weapons, martial weapons, or specific things like daggers and quarterstaves. All of these are classed. So they come under two main categories of simple weapons and martial weapons. A simple weapon is something like a club um, or a quarter staff, very basic stuff, daggers. Martial weapons are things that are a bit more involved, like a sword. Um, and then you have ranged stuff. So under simple weapons, you have simple melee weapons, and simple ranged weapons. A simple ranged weapon could be a sling, something like that. It's the same under martial weapons. You have martial melee weapons where it's, you know, close range. Then you've got martial ranged weapons, cool stuff like long bows and heavy crossbows, stuff like that. But if it says simple weapons, that includes melee and ranged. If it says you're proficient with martial weapons, that means both melee and ranged. Um, so, you know, with a fighter, you're, you're proficient with both. So basically any weapon you pick up, you add your proficiency bonus to it, which is pretty handy. The only other thing to take into account is, as I said earlier, melee weapons use your strength. So close range, they use your strength. Long range, they use dexterity. So that means if you're wielding a sword, you add your strength modifier. If you're wielding a bow, you add your dexterity modifier. There's one caveat there that's pretty interesting. 
which is the finesse property. So as you read through the weapons, they'll have properties. There's one called finesse. And what finesse does, it allows you to pick. You can decide whether to use either your strength or your dexterity to add to your attack roll and your damage roll. Now you have to do it for both. So if you pick your strength, you have to use your strength for the attack roll and the damage roll. Same with dexterity. It may not apply to you if you're playing as a fighter character who's close range, but it's good to know that you have that option so that if you're a ranger or a rogue that's put a lot into dexterity, you can also use certain swords like uh, a, a rapier where you get to use your dexterity to make your attack roll. It's very handy. So after we've done, you know, proficiency of weapons. Which weapons do you get? Well, that's under your class. It tells you. There's a list of equipment and it will tell you the weapons. So under weapons it will tell you, you know, you get two axes or two simple weapons. That means you can take the axes or you can pick two simple weapons from the simple weapons list. It's as simple as that. Again, rule of cool. Something seems interesting. Pick that. I'd recommend picking the weapons on offer. If it says pick two axes or pick two simple weapons, take the two axes just because it's easier. You're not really sure and it's sort of what they're suggesting you should take on your first go. Once you've got a bit more of a handle on the weapons and do that. If you're someone coming to the game that's like, I've always wanted to use, you know, a longsword, then go ahead and pick a longsword if that's what you want to use and I'm sure you have a great time using it. There's a few rules on there, but again, ask your game master if you're not sure about the specific rule of a weapon they'll be more than happy to help uh, I know that I would with my players so you equip the weapon let's say come in you've got a short sword you've equipped it you added your strength modifier to your attack roll and your proficiency bonus so your strength modifier of two and your proficiency bonus of two for a plus four so when you roll to hit an enemy, you roll a d20, you get to add 4. And then when you roll your damage, you get to add 2 your strength modifier. It's great. So now we're going to move on to armor. Armor is pretty simple. Um, your armor class begins at 10. So what is armor class, now that I've said that? <laughs> Armor class is how difficult it is to hit you. So your armor class is a combination of many things boiled down to very simple numerical value. Your armor class represents how quick you are, if you can dodge out of the way of blows. Sort of how tough your armor is, how good you are at defending yourself. This number represents all of these things to you. And when someone's making their attack roll, when they're rolling to hit you, they roll the d20, they add their strength modifier, they add their proficiency bonus. All of this is trying to equal your armor class or higher so that they can hit you. So as I said, the number for your armor class, the number someone has to roll to to hit you starts at 10. And then it goes up from there. That's your baseline, 10. So how do we determine how much it goes up? It's easy. If you're not wearing any armor at all, you just add your dexterity modifier. So if you've got a dexterity modifier of 2, it's 10 plus 2. Your armor class is 12 because you're pretty fast. So even if you're not wearing armor, you got a pretty good armor class. That's pretty simple. The next thing you could have is light armor. So something like leather armor. Light armor automatically gives you an 11 for your armor class plus your dexterity. So let's say you've got dexterity 2, you put on light armor, your armor class goes from 10 to 11 plus your dexterity modifier becomes 13. It's pretty good, it gives you a plus 1 basically to um, your armor class. Now that's generally speaking about light armor, that's saying that most light armor in the game that's what it will do. Okay, and I'll do the same for medium armor and heavy armor. Read the rules for whatever armor you get, but generally speaking, 
that's how they work, it's just to give you an idea of the different armor classes. So next up would be medium armor. Uh, medium armor generally takes your armor class up to 12 automatically and then allows you to add your dexterity modifier to a maximum of two. So what the hell does all of that mean? It means medium armor gives you an armor class of 12 and then you can increase it by another two using your dexterity and no higher. So let's say your character has a dexterity modifier of three, you get some medium armor on, your armor class goes to 12. Your armor class can only go up to 14, you can only add two. Even though you have dexterity modifier of three, two is the maximum for, for medium armor. So 14 is sort of the cap. If your dexterity modifier is lower, if it's a one, uh, you only add one. It goes up to 13. But yeah, two is the maximum, generally speaking, that you can add to from a dexterity modifier to your armor class value. Heavy armor, there is no dexterity bonus. Your heavy armor is a flat armor class value given to you by wearing it. Let's say it's a 16, that's it. You get a 16 for your armor class. It's pretty good, but it does not allow for any dexterity bonuses that you may have. And again, generally speaking, heavy armor gives you disadvantage on stealth checks so you're not as good at being stealthy so what the hell does disadvantage mean as I quickly sip my tea disadvantage means that you aren't quite in a situation to do as well when you roll your 20 sided dice to determine an outcome so on any given day you're trying to do something in Dungeons and Dragons so you roll a 20 sided dice to determine whether you can succeed or not if you are at disadvantage you roll two 20 sided dice and you use the lowest result so if you roll a 12 and an 8 at disadvantage you use the 8 and discard the 12 complete opposite for advantage if you in a good situation you have advantage on a check you roll 2d20, you get a 12 and an 8, you discard the 8 and you use the 12. So that's advantage and disadvantage. Very simple rule to get around changing numbers all the time in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it works pretty great. But yeah, um, going back to the heavy armor, it gives you disadvantage on stealth checks most of the time. Again, this is a very general thing for armor. Just to give you an idea of how the numbers calculated. But again, your armor class, your ability to dodge or take hits is determined simply by a number called your armor class value. And you determine this by any armor you have or lack of armor, uh, dexterity modifiers. If you have heavy armor, no dexterity modifiers. You record that in your character sheet. So next up, we have inventory. So you've got your weapons equipped. So the weapons from your class that are given to you. Got your armor from the class that's given to you. There's a bunch of other stuff written down under your class. Where does that go? That goes in your inventory. So just chuck all of that stuff in your inventory. Worry about it later. Write it down on the list. It's part of your character. One thing included typically when you're picking a class is a pack. What the hell is a pack I hear you asking? Well, a pack... Think of it as a goodie bag. You get a bunch of stuff in it that's automatically added to your character. You usually get a choice of two packs, like a Dungeoneer's pack and an Explorer's pack is a pretty typical pair. Within these goodie bags, it's a set thing, what is in there. It will tell you. If you Google it, you know, what's in a Dungeoneer's pack in Dungeons and Dragons? It will list it out. Everything you get every time you play. You get rations, you get a bedroll, you get a tinderbox. A bunch of stuff you need for camping and traveling and surviving in the wild. Get a few little bonus items. Some of it's for flavor. Rations. Do you need to eat in the game? Yeah, you do. But your dungeon master might say, eh, you guys are having fun without all that survival stuff. I won't worry so much about the rations. Or they might keep track of it one by one, exactly how many rations you need or not. 
It's entirely up to them. I wouldn't worry about it until you start the game. Sometimes you get items that are sort of for flavour. So if you get a priest pack, I think it's got stuff like incense. So, you know, it might be used for rituals, things like that. You could just use it for flavour. But um, yeah, the packs are just extra items. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I'll just add it to your inventory and that'll be the end of it. So we've done your ability scores. We've done your skill modifiers. We've done your weapon, your armor. We've listed your inventory. Next up, we are gonna calculate your hit points. So what are hit points? If you've played a video game before, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you've got 10 hit points, you know, that's how many hits you can take until you reach zero, at which point you're dead. Obviously, you don't take one hit point damage at a time. It's variable. Someone rolls a d6 and gets a 5. Your 10 hit points goes down to 5 hit points. I mean, hit points are pretty self-explanatory. I think most people will know what it is and how it works. And if you're not too sure, the first time you go through combat, you'll learn pretty quickly when you reach zero hit points and are forced to make what is called a death save, which I can explain after this section briefly. But hit points are determined by your class. So if you're a class and it says you get eight hit, eight hit points to start with, plus your constitution modifier. So as I said earlier, constitution affects no skills whatsoever, but it does directly affect how many hit points you have. So if you start with 8 hit points plus your constitution, and your constitution modifier is 10, that means you get 10 hit points. So, does that carry on level to level? Yes, you continue to add your constitution modifier as you level up, you get more hit points each time you level up, and so... If you've got 10 hit points to begin with, you know, you could have another 10 on the next level. It's sort of determined by your game master again how they want to generate hit points for each further level. But to begin with, it's a flat rate. It is a number plus your constitution modifier and it will tell you directly under your class um, when you look through the player's handbook. But as we are going through this just for fun I'll tell you about a death save so you reach zero hit points what happens now you have to roll death saves so a death save is a d20 a 20 sided dice we use them for everything you have to roll a 10 or higher three times to stabilize yourself and not die now that doesn't have to be consecutive you don't have to roll 10 or higher three times in a row you just got to do it three times if you roll less than 10 three times beforehand, then you die. And that's basically a death save. They'll go through it when you play, but that is the very basic mechanic. You do not get to add any modifiers. You just roll the 20 sided dice and the result is the result. So now we've done hit points. Let's go on to hit dice. It will tell you under your class how many hit dice you get you start with one hit dice it will tell you the value of that dice so whether it's a d6 for a six sided dice or a d8 for an eight sided dice you get one of that dice at level one now what is a hit dice i hear you asking well a hit dice is used to regenerate hit points when you are resting only when you have a short rest though there are two types of resting in the game. Short rest, long rest. A short rest is like a four hour napathon where you roll your hit dice and regain that many hit points. It's quite straightforward when you go through it in the game. So you just need to record the hit dice for that. While we're on the subject, a long rest is eight hours. It regenerates all of your hit points. It does not use your hit dice. And any hit dice you have used are regenerated when you take a long rest. It's a pretty simple mechanic. I wouldn't worry too much about the hit dice. Some people take so many long rests throughout the game that they rarely use the hit dice. But just write down what it says under your class. 
for the hit dice on your sheet so you've got it there for when you need it. Next up to figure out for your character is to calculate your initiative. What is initiative? Initiative is how fast you are in combat. So it determines your turn order. So when combat happens, we all take turns. You take a turn, I take a turn, the evil goblin we're fighting takes a turn. But the initiative determines in what order we take that turn. So your initiative quite simply is your dexterity modifier so combat begins the game master says to you a goblin jumps out he's going to attack you roll initiative you roll a d20 a 20 sided dice and you add your dexterity modifier so if you roll a 10 and your dexterity modifier is 2 your initiative is 12 and you tell your game master I got a 12 and he says okay that's great you know the, you go first uh, or maybe you rolled a 2 you for a total of four and you go last it all depends but it helps to vary up combat so that the same person isn't always going first your modifier isn't, doesn't make a huge difference but it does make a small enough difference that you don't feel cheated if you roll low so now you have your initiative which is your dexterity modifier we calculate your passive perception what the hell is passive Perception. Your passive perception. Think of it as your peripheral vision. So your central vision is what you're paying attention to, what you're looking at, what you're concentrating on. And your passive perception is your peripheral vision. Do you notice anything around you? So obviously perception is anything to do with smell, hearing, vision. Do you manage to notice anything or do you not? So... Passive perception works mechanically that if someone wants to sneak up on you, they have to roll a d20, a 20 sided dice, they have to roll, add their stealth skill modifier to that result, so roll a 10, they have a stealth skill modifier of 14 because they're proficient with it, oh, a 4 sorry, because they're proficient it becomes a f total of 14, they roll a 10, they get a 4, total of 14, your passive perception value is 13 that means because their stealth skill rolled higher than your passive perception you do not notice them they manage to sneak by you so if you've got a high passive perception you catch people sneaking around you trying to steal out of your pockets or doing anything underhanded if you have a low passive perception you don't notice a bloody thing so how do we determine your passive perception it's your wisdom modifier plus 10 so if your wisdom modifier is 1, your passive perception is 11. It's as simple as that. Um, you determine your passive perception, write it down in your character sheet. Your game master might need it if they're trying to sneak around you. I know that I keep people's passive perception written down so that I can sneak stuff around them without them knowing. But your game master might need to ask you f for a spell or, or something at some point. So... Um, it's good to have it written down and that's your character that's it you're done you've got your base ability scores you have your ability score modifiers you have your ability score saving throws and you added your proficiency bonus to two of those saving throws based on your character class you have your skill modifiers so you have 18 skills which are directly related to your ability score modifiers and you get to add your proficiency bonus to a select number of those skills based on your class and sometimes your background it will tell you under your background you have your weapons equipped so the weapons you picked from your class are equipped in your character you've got your attack roll modifier of potentially your strength and proficiency bonus you've got your damage roll modifier which is usually just your strength and no proficiency bonus. Or your armor class, which is based on what you're wearing or not wearing. Uh, you have the rest of your inventory, which we went through, where you get some additional items. Sometimes they're useful in games, sometimes they're sort of for flavor, although that's debatable. I'm sure lots of people would love to debate on that. Um, next up, we did your hit points, 
which is how much damage you can take directly. Your hit dice, which is how much damage you can recover in a short rest. You've got your initiative, which is how quickly you um, react in combat. And then we had your passive perception, which is your ability to notice anything going on around you. Those are the basic things you need to get started. You get some features and stuff through your class and through your character background. You write those down as well. Take those into account. Just read them through. They're pretty straightforward. But that's all you need to get a character going. All these steps are written down on the guide at our website, knightsofthebrail.com, under the game materials section. You can always ask questions in the Discord. Um, we're always happy to help chat about this stuff and um, yeah you're ready to get started I'm always trying to run one shots in the discord um, just go ahead and ask if you want one and I'm happy to set one up and uh, yeah welcome to Dungeons and Dragons if you've got any questions um, please do ask Thank you for listening to Knights of the Braille. If you're interested in our groups, please visit our website, knightsofthebraille.com. Whether you want to run a game, join a game, or learn how we play, our website holds a lot of answers. Join our Discord, where we have discussions and run games. Follow us on Twitter to help spread the word of accessibility in tabletop gaming. Any support you show our community is greatly appreciated. Thank you.